Hello, everybody. I've been, I guess I'm dating myself, but I've been working on tree fruit since my master's, so it's over 30 years now. Um, I want to talk to you today about a little bit of a historical pr perspective. Of it. I think last or two weeks ago, you read the paper by Ed Rajat and myself, where we coined the term IPPM, because uh, it's always protection of bees has always been part of IPM, but it's become much more important, as I'll talk about in a second. So we kind of coined that, coined that term. I believe you also have a paper by one of my former students. Uh, Sarah Heller that you've read for this and we can talk about later. I'm going to present a little bit of the information from that as well. But uh, first of all, Pennsylvania is a very smeared here about, about number three or four in terms of apple production for the U.S., about 10,000 hectares in the state. I'm mostly going to talk about IPM and in, in, uh, apples because it's much more developed than in peaches or pears uh, that we have down here. Pears are, are dominated by Paracilla and a lot of pyrethroids, same thing with the peaches. So the next one. I don't know if you guys can see the whole thing on there or not. I'm getting part of mine's cut off. The biggest thing that's happened in tree fruit, I would say, in the last 40 or 50 years has been the Food Quality Protection Act, which basically banned all the pesticides that were out in the orchards when I was a student. It was fairly common when I was a student to walk out in the orchards and see dead birds, uh, mice, things like that out there because the organophosphates and carbamates pretty much killed everything. And there were very few uh, beneficial insects that could survive it. We did try to uh, conserve those, but the Food Quality Protection Act said cheap and effective is not in, important anymore. It's protecting people. And as I'll get into, that has shifted as we got rid of the old neurotoxin poisons to environmental safety. Next one. Next. Uh, a little background for the state. Uh, since I've been starting to work in here, we've switched from two honeybee hives per acre to depending on or depending almost completely on wild pollinators. And I'll go into some reasons for that later, but this is a survey of New York and Pennsylvania growers where over half of them are not using honeybees anymore. In 2006 with colony collapse disorder, the price went from $35 a hive to over $125 a hive. They recommend two hives per acre and growers uh, just found out that, just found that the uh, expense was too much, especially since we started demonstrating because of some unique aspects in our orchards in Pennsylvania, they would get along without them and rely on the wild bees. But that means modifying our IPM programs. Go ahead. And I started as a taxonomist and I have a collection of probably close to 200,000 bees down here now that we've collected since 2007. Uh, we find that, you know, there's about 40 or 50 species that vary from season to season that are pollinating our apples in Pennsylvania. Uh, similar thing in New York as well. So uh, we do have a lot of other bees that can pick up the slack for the honeybees. And the problem with uh, apple production in Pennsylvania too is we compete with honeybee hives from California almonds. So in an early season, it's hard to get enough honeybee hives back. So there's been shortages and then like the, I said before, the prices are too high, go ahead. And just as an example, one of the bees I work with, the Japanese orchard bee, it's a mason bee called Osmia cornifrons was introduced actually almost uh, directly at the station here about uh, 40 years ago. It brought in from Japan on a bee per bee basis, these guys are 80 times more efficient than honeybees. Uh, a single osmia can visit 15 flowers a minute set about 2,500 fruit in a single visit. Honeybees will take um, two visits to do it and they only do about 50 flowers per, sea, or per, per bee. So these are in orders of magnitude, much more efficient in most cases. Go ahead. And the thing with tree fruit too, this is not looking at yield. I grew up on a, a field crop farm where it was a tons per acre. And that's still true mostly of cherries where it's more about the yield per acre. But in apples, it's more about the size and quality. So apples, you only need two to 5% of all the apple blooms to set to be pollinated well by a bee and set a fruit to have a full crop. Anything more, and you're gonna have to chemically thin them to get them off. You don't want a bunch of small little marbles. You wanna get good sized fruit with a lot of seeds. Peaches, the requirement's a little bit higher. It's 15 to 20%, but growers have it in their heads since they never used bees in peaches in Pennsylvania that they're wind pollinated. They are not. They're also bee pollinated and they've been relying on these wild bees for decades. Uh, go ahead. And the reason we can do it is because our orchards are relatively small. This is not like the big orchards in Michigan or the, the big fields out in the Midwest field crops. We have a lot of habitat where these wild bees can fly in. Our orchards tend to be less than 10 acres, about two and a half hectares in size, and with a couple hundred meters of a woods or a fence row where the bees can fly in. Go ahead. 
uh, aerial map of this. This is just some data from one of my other uh, students that I uh, worked with, uh, Melanie Kammer, basically showing that in Pennsylvania, most of our landscape is actually forest. And our orchards tend to be on the sides of these uh, small mountains here. A lot of gullies with fence rows, a lot of wooded areas where the bees can fly in. That's why we can rely on them rather than on honeybees. And uh, Melanie Kammer showed that you know, we think that most of the bees are not li living in the orchards anymore. They're flying in from the edges. And Melanie Kaminer did a really nice study that she published uh, showing that uh, we have a lot of plant diversity around these orchards. And that plant diversity is what drives the bee diversity that we have. Go ahead. Uh, these bees, they vary quite a bit in size. I mean, if you look at this graph here, honeybees, they fly a long distance. It's hard to, when you're looking at pesticide impacts to figure out anything with honeybees because they'll fly a couple, uh, four or five kilometers. Bumblebees the same thing, but bumblebees and apples, they're all queens. The colonies die off, so there's not very many numbers. They don't really care about the distance so much, but you look at the solitary bees, the numbers do go down as you get within uh, out 200 meters from the edge of the woods. But when we looked at the fruit, looking at the size and everything at, in several, I think it was about 10 different orchards over a four year period, we cannot find any difference in yield or size in orchards that did not have honeybees and relied on these wild bees. Those little green bars, they may look like they're lower, than the other numbers, but remember they're 80, up to 80 times more efficient than the honeybee for pollination. So within 200 meters of an orchard, I mean of a fence row or field or wooded area, we seem to be doing okay and that entails most of our orchards. Go ahead. And the th three things pollinators need, I know Mace Vaughn talked a couple of weeks ago and he probably went over this quite a bit. We've worked with them a lot. Food pollen, uh, nest sites are really important for bees like Osmia who nest in wood. So we've got to make sure that that's out there as well. And often the pollinator strips do that. And the area I really concentrate is protection from harmful, harmful pesticides. Go ahead. Now, if we were trying to do this in orchards in Lancaster area where it's all field crops with a few orchards in the middle, there's no fence rows, no woodlots, there's no place for those wild bees to come from. So you'd be in big trouble. Go ahead. Oh, must be another, hit the slide again. Okay, uh, this is the biggest orchard we have in the area around, just about 100 acres. And a lot of these pollinator strips that people have put in, they put them right along the edge of the woods, where, which are they're kind of redundant. What we've tried to do is these X's in here are where we think there's pollinator limitations from bees flying out, basically 200 meters from the edge of that woods. Put the pollinator habitat in there and let them it'll serve as nesting sites and food sites. And instead of putting maybe two honeybee hives per acre in this 100 acres, so 200 hives, you can rely on a model that would say 200 meters out from the edge of the woods, you can rely on the wild bees, put your honeybees in the center and put your pollinator strips in the centers too, where they're thinking with stepping stones from the wooded areas uh, for the bees to have good places to nest and to feed. Go ahead. And, you know, when we did these early pollinator strips, you have to think about the crop. The uh, NRCS uh, pollinator plantings, the, the seed mixes were really geared for mid-season crops. And none of them bloomed until after bloom of apple. So we moved away from some of these uh, perennial uh, wildflowers and stuff to planting things like red maples and willow trees and things like that, that will give the bees, the like mason bees and, and drenda bees, which are main apple pollinators, some food early in the spring before apple bloom. And we don't want to pull them out of the apples, uh, so we say with something like redbud, which is very attractive to certain of the, the wild bees as well, because we want them to stay in the apples. And a lot of the bees and apples tend to be univoltine, so we don't have to worry as much about them in the summer, but we would like to build up those bumblebee nests. So these pollinator strips work really well on the multivoltine species as well. Go ahead. There have been some changes, some of which I, I work for a chemical company as an R&D rep for eight years, Roman Haas, I got tired of that uh, uh, and some of the things that went on with that. Turn from the dark side of the forest as I joke with different farmers and growers. Um, there has been some superficial changes to the labels, but they don't often bring in all the information you need to. Uh, we're working very, uh, I got a couple of students, one of them stuck in Vietnam with COVID restrictions right now, but we've been looking at wild bees susceptibility to pesticides. Everything on the labels is based on honeybees and we're finding more and more that the honeybee is a lot more tolerant to uh, many of our insecticides than the wild bees, uh, but we'll be publishing on that soon. Go ahead. And if, if we were meeting in person, I have about a couple hundred of these little pamphlets, but you can get it online. It's a, a nice little booklet of identification. And at the back, I do pesticide testing, both in the lab and in orchards. 
trying to rank the effects of various insecticides in tree fruits on bees. Doesn't always agree with what Zerci says, doesn't always agree with everybody else, but it's based on our experience. And as we're getting more and more into testing and seeing the susceptibility of wild bees, we're getting a better handle on that. Uh, and my student, Nop Than, uh, NGOC, PHAN, she just published a paper, the very first one on uh, standardizing a pesticide bioassay, hopefully for EPA in the future, up for testing insecticides on osmia, which is a different family. It's not an ape, it's a mega chylid. Go ahead. And I get calls every, you know, at least once or twice a month from different states, sometimes state representative uh, groups that uh, want to ban all neonics. And one of the things I have to get across to people is that the neonics vary quite a bit. Uh, some of them are much more toxic than Carbaryl uh, 7, which uh, it was a pretty toxic carbamate. Some of them are much safer, but it depends on if you're talking about ingestion or by contact. Uh, bees and apple oranges don't walk around on the leaves. They go straight to flowers, so they're mostly getting exposed from nectar and pollen at bloom. And I believe the paper you have from my student, Sarah uh, Heller, um, she talks about all the work we did basically collecting nectar and pollen and testing pesticides and that uh, at certain points before the sprays, you would see high levels, maybe 40 to 70 parts per billion. And the second paper, which hasn't come out yet, uh, basically we changed the timing. So I'll talk about that a little bit more later, okay? Uh, people talk about banning neonics. I've just done calls, two of them last week about this for Maryland and for some different food uh, groups uh, trying to put restrictions on labels. What do you do if you don't have neonics? Um, back in the 2008 period or so, when we got rid of had the FQPA getting rid of all the old pesticides, we basically developed new IPM systems and with what we called reduced risk pesticides. They were safe to people, maybe safer to beneficials, maybe safer to the environment. Neonics were part of that. And we weaned ourselves away from that, but there's some uh, insect pests like this rosy apple aphid, which attacks the apples during bloom. It stunts the fruit. So you got these tiny little marbles at the, the bottom compared to the normal fruit at, at the top. It's resistant to all pyrethroids. It's resistant to lores band. The only thing that really works right now is um, are the neonics. And uh, there's one product called flonicomid. Uh, one of the problems that comes up is people like, well, I'll get rid of the Neenix and well, we're going to substitute them with new products. Well, it went from 26 companies when I was a R&D rep for Roman Haas to four or five now, but not developing new insecticides very rapidly and they don't really care about minor crops. So there's not a lot of new products being developed. And if we have to revert to uh, pyrethroids, which are more toxic to IPM and the most sort of beneficials would be in real trouble. We would destroy our IPM systems. Neonex, when applied by foliar rather than the seed treatments, the drenches, the stuff you see in the news, within 36 hours, most of these compounds are in the leaf to where they cannot impact any of the, the good bugs, the beneficials, the, the predators and parasitoids on the leaf surface. The problem is that they will move into the nectar and pollen. We have to minimize that. Go ahead. Uh, and we've put these all into different recommendations for growers in a, what we call a tree fruit production guide. It's rather large. I think it's over 440 pages. Uh, and we update that every two years. And we basically put in these uh, recommendations. The work that was based on Sarah Heller's work, which basically you know, said that a pink spray, uh, you can get 40 to 70 parts per billion in the nectar and pollen five days later during bloom. That can be toxic to osmia. It does not appear to be at a level high enough to really affect the bumblebees, I mean, the honeybees. But we did a lot of work in that paper that we're still trying to get published here, um, where we moved the timing back uh, 10 days, 10 to 12 days earlier at a stage known as half inch green. We finally got the same level of control of the rose apple aphid pest, the one that was resistant to other uh, products. Um, and we didn't have any movement. It was less than two parts per billion below detection limit in the nectar and pollen. So rather than banning it, we just moved the, our recommendations from pink spray five to seven days before bloom to another 14 days before that at the same level of control, but eliminated the problem of the, the neonic moving into the nectar and pollen. We also specify which ones based on toxicity. So products like acetamiprid will do a very good job in controlling this pest. Um, and they're much less toxic to bees by ingestion and by contact. Um, than what the other products are. So thiamethoxam, very toxic to bees, it is, is recommended to be used during uh, before bloom, but we do not recommend it anymore. Growers follow that. Um, nothing is allowed to be sprayed during bloom. 
this old adage of well spray at night or early in the morning doesn't really hold true if you got a wild depending on wild bees like the squash bee that fly at the crack of dawn or osmia which fly earlier as well um there it's basically you've got to get the the source of their poisoning down so Laura's ban is about to be phased out. I get a lot of people wanting to try to save that product. It's, it's going to be gone soon. It's one of the organophosphates that FQPA did not kill in time. But like I said, the, for rosy apple aphids, we moved to half inch green. We have products that we will allow. This was hard to scout for. So you often have to do a, a prophylactic spray based on last year's uh, injury. Uh, so they put it on before they can see it because the damage, if you wait till the population to build, those fruit are already stunted. So we moved the timing back to half inch green for most of the neonics. We banned, or at least not recommended, certain ones that are more toxic to bees. So acetamiprid, we used to have, um, uh, oh, it's called uh, Calypso, thioclopid, but that was eliminated as well. There's some other ones, Savanto, uh, other things out there. And there's one product called uh, Belief, Flanicamid, which is safe to bees and works well as well. So we're always looking for alternatives and a way to minimize any of the exposure during bloom. Petal fall sprays, uh, the big problem with that is that growers often think that petal fall is when the first blossom falls or 80% in those wild bees with a, that are often have a single generation, they have to be really protected at petal fall. You can devastate the populations by coming in a little bit too early because 80% of petal fall is still 20% bloom. And you can still kill those bees that don't have a next generation on there. So say Osmia, I've had growers wipe out 20,000 of miasmia within a single spray of, uh, of a harsh pesticide at petal fall. And they said, well, we put it on in an evening. Well, it doesn't matter. Um, so petal fall sprays, you have to adjust a little bit, but growers are getting used to the idea that, you know, this is saving them money by not having to rent honeybees and they can play with the system a little bit. So we've had pretty good adoption with probably 80 to 90% growers not using honeybees now and relying on the wild pollinators and hopefully uh, following our programs to save the bees. Go ahead. So take home, most Pennsylvania growers are not using honeybees and apples and peaches. Uh, we have a good uh, wide variety of bees and we don't rely on a single one. Osmia is nice. It's probably best fit in Pennsylvania is actually for Asian pear production because honeybees hate them. There's not enough sugar in the nectar. Uh, they won't really go to pears uh, and they're high value if you get the larger fruit. So the more seeds you set in apples and pears from good pollination and good pollen transfer, the bigger the fruit and you get a premium for large Asian pears. So we have relatively little production here, but for people that wanna raise osmia as an alternative uh, to honeybees and pears, that is a good fit. To me right now, I've kind of come around to osmia as just another, well, we actually have seven species of osmia here, but osmia cornifrons is just another one of those wild bees that we're gonna rely on the 50 or 60% yeah, to get that, uh, that bloom set. And remember, we don't need the full crop. It's not like we're looking at pounds per acre or tons per acre. We're looking at a number of large uh, shapely fruit. So we've gotten away from running the honeybees. That saves them up to $250 an acre. And instead of pushing out their fence rows and farming from, you know, all within the eyes uh, can see, we have them leaving in fence rows. When they push out orchards, push some apple trees into the fence rows and the woodlots to serve as nesting sites for the osmia. And the biggest thing has been getting to consider bees with a pesticide selection. Go ahead. This is the last one. And I just want to thank, we've had very good luck getting funding from different uh, agencies. Uh, I've been working on the Discover Life Keys, trying to, I started out as a taxonomist and early in my career and kind of got away from it, but I'm getting back into bee identifications. And it's fascinating how many are out there. And we've had very good graduate students over the years that have helped us um, with a different products. We have a, I think we had 12 papers published last year. COVID's good for something, but I've had other students that are stuck overseas. So we'll keep pushing it out. And I think this is a better way of looking at it than the phone calls I get wanting to ban all of the neonics or this or that. There are not that many tools out there for the growers to use. And I deal directly with the growers. And through Xerces, I deal with the public and they kind of work in between. Uh, you have to look at how they're being used. And then uh, Xerces has the how neonicotinoids can kill the bees. And before that is our neonicotinoids killing the bees. I worked with them to try to get a, a more of an agricultural perspective with it and look at the method of application, the timing, how you can change the timing with non-selected products. And, and truthfully, neonix are very beneficial for IPM and tree fruit. They allow our predatory mites to eliminate all miticide sprays. 
Some were very effective on, on leaf roller, laws of the leaf roller parasites to, to move in there as well. If we lost the index and went to pyrethroids, we'd be spraying much more often for mites, San Jose, things like San Jose scale and aphids. So neonics are still important. We're kind of moving away from them to maybe only one or two a, a season now as we got the diamides, but we're, we're worried about resistance to the diamides as well. So we like to keep as many tools in the toolbox as we can for IPM and, and learn how to use them the right way. That's, that's safe for all the beneficials. And I believe that's it. We had a little extra time. Probably talk too fast for, for catch you though. <laughs> we have time for one question. If anybody has any questions for David before we hear from Katya. I have a question. Please talk. Um, so, uh, so I'm curious, you know, sort of mapping out the effects of these different pesticides on bees, and then also sort of like the effects of timing of application on the residues, like that is not, those are like not easy experiments to do. And so is this something, you know, like do all the growers use the same set of pesticides year after year? So you can sort of, you know, create this, um, this guidebook pretty easily, or do you, you know, is this something where um, every year, every grower, there's something different. And so it's just, you know, not really feasible to, to provide this level of detailed information. In, in general, I mean, it was not easy work to do. As I think, you know, we took a little micro pipettes and sucked the nectar out of 50 flowers off from, I don't know, 20 different treatments. Had to send off for analysis. It was not something I want to repeat again anytime soon. And the big labs want three grams of nectar, which is like take the whole orchard and put it in a blender to get the nectar out because you're not going to get three grams of nectar. Pollen was easier. We did it once and, you know, I looked at the whole system and what is the biggest vulnerability of pollinators to uh, pesticides? And it was these pre bloom sprays that were showing up the nectar and pollen. So we did it once. We haven't had a lot of new products developed since then. There are a few pseudo neonics that are in there that we still test for. But this was basically recommendations for a single pest that may or may not show up in there and, and they have to do some scouting on their cell. Using the spray, same spray program year after year is not IPM. You have to adjust it. But this is a pest that you have to often spray prophylactically because if you wait until you see them, the fruit are already dwarfed and deformed to where you can't use them. So growers that have a problem and they're mostly coming in from plantains and the ground cover. So if you could get rid of those with a good herbicide program, you could probably eliminate a lot of the problem, but they know they're going to have it. This is, you know, the recommendations in this case have held through pretty well. We stopped using Neonex after bloom for the most part. So they're not really a consideration. And because of diseases from nematodes and dandelions and weeds in there, they keep the orchard pretty clean from other plants that would bloom. So the bees are not really flying in later in the season as much. Um, you know, so this is the big, this is the biggest weak link, I guess, in the whole system in terms of bee poisoning. And I think we've taken care of that. We'll have to adjust a little bit as newer products are developed, but I don't want to suck any more nectar out of flowers. <laughs> Thanks. Did I answer it? Yes. Yeah. Thank you, David. All right. Well, I think uh, hopefully you can all see this PowerPoint presentation. And uh, if you can't, I guess let me know. Um, and we'll hear from Katya next. Yes. Hello. Um, greetings to you as from, from Lake Constance area. And um, I would just head off as I think I will maybe uh, running out of time at the end. So um, I was invited by University of Freiburg, Professor Klein, and I am really glad to present you our region and what we are doing in apple growing here. So short introduction to our area, to our region. We are located uh, from Constance. It's more or less in, in the middle here in this uh, chart. Um, the fruit growers are just around the lake um, from Constance to Lindau. This is the German side. On the other side, on the south shore, you have Switzerland. And uh, the orange uh, part is Austria. So we are in a triangle of these three countries. And uh, the border is just within our lake, within the Lake Constance, named after the city of Constance. So next one. Here you have just uh, another view. And what you can see in the southwest of our lake is the city of Zürich. So this is the, the biggest city we have in our surrounding. Um, all other cities are just small. Uh, the landscape is really rural. And uh, next one. 
Here you have a look from our North Shore from the German side and you can see our landscape and I saw from David's uh, charts from David's slides it's just uh, more or less the same but different um, so you can see here um, the, the gray and white and uh, dark gray um, parts in the middle um, just uh, more to us um, to the to the downside. Um, these are the hail nettings of our orchards. So we have meanwhile 70% under hail nettings. Otherwise, we couldn't survive. Otherwise, the family farms would have to give up fruit growing um, as we have several hailstorms each year. Um, we have several Alp valleys from the Swiss side. Um, the hailstorms are coming across the lake, but uh, with the hail nettings and the really uh, modern techniques, we can survive. So next one. And uh, this is more or less 10 kilometers uh, from the lake. Uh, we have several areas still without hail nettings. Um, you see these white dots. Uh, these are old apple trees, pear trees, uh, cherry trees. So this is the old uh, type of fruit growing my grandparents did. And uh, this is uh, really good for the biodiversity of the landscape. Uh, sometimes it's difficult for the family farms just because they get some uh, pests uh, with those old trees. Um, but with a, with a high level IP, we can manage it. So next one. And here, um, these uh, green squares, these green dots are our pack houses. So our cooperation of Marktgemeinschaft Bodenseeobst has several pack houses so that the family farms don't have to go big distances uh, to bring uh, their crop um, to the pack houses. At the pack houses, uh, the food is graded and is spread uh, to the southern half of Germany, to the supermarkets and markets. So next one. This is a picture I took today. I went up the hill, um, the village is called Mountain, and I looked just uh, to, our, um, to my office. So in between uh, the two um, trees here, the dark trees, you see a small building um, and there I'm sitting or standing now and giving the talk. So next one. And we got uh, 50 centimeters of snow. So we haven't that much snow since 15 years uh, within two days. It's great landscape. You can see um, the hail netting orchards. You can see a bit of vineyard to the left and to the right. And um, in the middle, more right hand, you see um, the highest mountain, the Santis. It's uh, more or less um, 2,000 meters height on the Swiss side. So next one. Just a short description of the Farmers Association Corporation I'm working for. I'm part of the advisory and extension team there. Um, we have uh, 350 members, all family farms. Average, uh, they are growing apples and some other fruit on 12 hectares. So um, 12,000, no. Just uh, let me see. Yeah, uh, 12 hectares. Um, and we have, uh, in total, we have 1,000 family farms in the region. There is another cooperative we are working very closely with. Um, in our cooperative, we have 4,000 hectares commercial orchards. All the region is more than double. And uh, we are growing at Marktgemeinschaft EG um, 100,000 tons of fruit production per year. These are 90% apples, and uh, this is a turnover for our family farms of uh, more than 40 million euro per year. So the next one. Um, our region, we have, uh, we call it uh, in German, a fruit farmers NGO called Le Constant Region Fruit Growers. And uh, in total, um, all the fruit grower, all the family farms, they produce 250 tons fruit uh, per year. Um, that means 30% of the German apple production in our federal state, Baden-Württemberg in the Southwest, um, we have in total 37% of uh, the German production. So you can see 30% is in the Laconsens area and 7% of German apple production is in, in the other parts of the Southwest. And that's mean, that means we produce 20% of German apple consumption. And um, as uh, Cherry said at the beginning, we are quite a heart, one of the two hearts of apple production in Germany. The second heart, more or less as big as we are, um, is next to Hamburg, um, a very important fruit growing and apple growing area. The fruit production in Baden-Württemberg in total means just that you know about the landscape and uh, about the agricultural area here in the Southwest, 
Uh, the fruit production is 9% of the production area of plants in our federal state. So to arables, to vegetables, vineyards and hops, um, we have 9% fruit production. And uh, that means 1.5% 1 1 of agricultural area. In this agricultural area, there's the forest, there are several other types of uh, areas. So next one. And uh, now I want to talk to you about my main topic. Uh, it's our initiative for sustainable biodiversity um, on IP family farms on these uh, 900 farms um, and our yeah, development from 2008 to 2021. It's very close link for sure for our blooming orchards. It's very close linked uh, to, to the wild bee houses of Lake Constance. So you see one here on the picture. And so the next one. And it's very closely linked the initiative uh, to autoton um, plants, wildflowers, and uh, we are very close working together with a, a seed grower, we call it. Um, he is growing radio seeds certified, and this is a, a very big topic for our family farms to grow these regional autoton um, areas. So this is a picture of June. Um, you see um, more or less in, in the upper quarter, you see a bit of a hail net. You see um, in the middle, also above a bit of sea and, and then um, the clouds. And uh, we try to implement smaller areas of these uh, seeds, but also bigger areas. This was a pilot area of 1.5 hectares. So the next one. The same area in August, so we have um, other white flowers, other white plants that we want to establish there for the white pollinators, um, the insects all year long. So next one. And uh, what I want to present you is uh, now just uh, some spots of our wild bee and white pollinator monitorings. Um, we started with an entomologist. Um, external entomologist who is doing the monitorings independently and he's doing the first one in 2010 then in 13 and in 17 we really get got uh, very nice results so the next one we established um, until 2018 more or less or 17 um, two thousand two and a half thousand of these wild bee houses they are on the one for monitoring and evalu evaluating what about the population of um, solitary bees um, that are using uh, this habitat. Um, on the other, and on the other hand, uh, to show the people, to show the public, but also the family farms, what is going on uh, with the populations. So the next one. And this is unfortunately in German, I couldn't get it in English uh, that fast. Um, this is what uh, the entomologist entomologist um, was monitoring on one year areas. So we just seeded um, wildflowers and, and uh, yeah, sunflowers and so on for one year. And uh, so he was monitoring on 12 um, areas that there is in the average one um, species of uh, solitary bees that is on the red list. So it's hardly gone, let's say. Um, he monitored on each area in the average 17 species, 17 different species of solitary bees. And the individuals, he was, um, yeah, just, he, he, go, he went there a quarter of an hour and was just counting um, how many individuals are flying and this for three or four times. So in the average for these 12 areas, he was monitoring 126 to um, 110 um, individuals. And this was just on a, on a small um, area of, let's say, 15 square meters. So the next one. And this is what he what was monitoring in areas that are for three years, for five years, for six years um, um, planted or, or cultivated with these autochthon wildflowers and wild plants. Um, he was monitoring after three to five years, five species that are on our red list in Baden-Württemberg. Um, he monitored, uh, bit more than 30 different species on each area. And um, in total, he monitored individuals on these 50 square meters, around 100 to 120 individuals. And um, when we compared our monitoring from 2010 to 2017, we saw there was really an increase in species 
also in, in red list species, but also in individuals on these uh, three to five years areas. So the next one. And uh, for this initiative with all um, yeah, all the organization, all the work the family farmers do, um, we got the European Bee Award um, last year. Next slide, please. And we got the award um, for the increase in populations for the increase um, of species. Um, and because of on the very left hand, there is uh, the CEO of our NGO here in Lake Constance area, because everybody was working together, the NGOs, um, the, the farmers, the family farmers, and also uh, uh, yeah, a company um, for rehabilitation of workers that was uh, constructing and building all these wild bee houses. Next one, please. So um, just a, a short summary. Um, yeah, the basic of uh, winning this award was 30 years of practice of really good integrated apple production. Um, this means strategy and also knowing the flora and the fauna. And what was very important over all these decades, the cooperation with the beekeepers. So the cooperation with those who's who are caring about honeybees because uh, caring about honeybees plus IP fruit growing um, means also really um, a, good, a good start for the wild um, bee. Okay, and then the second one we, was, we were getting uh, the award for is that we improved the habit, habitats and uh, we were working um, with the autochton wildflowers and wild plants. And uh, was, was, what was also awarded is that we try to communicate with the public um, so everybody who is seeing a sprayer um, with a fruit grower on, um, he thinks, okay, we will harm the bees, we will harm the insects. And uh, we could start with these good monitoring uh, results in 2019 and 2020 um, to really communicate with the family farmers together um, to our public so that they, they rely on the IP um, of the fruit growers. So next slide, please. Just a short impression because it's, uh, similar to what David told you in his talk, um, you have to work on the IP every year. You have to see what you have resulted uh, the year before. You have to see uh, which uh, products that are really good IP products uh, you have available. And uh, you have to see, for example, also which non-endemic pests are coming up. So uh, we have uh, some problems appearing um, with flies and um, with stinky butts, but I think we can still manage it with the IP if, if you really do good education with the family farmers. So next slide. Um, what is very important for us, just an impression for you all, is uh, that we are caring about the application technique. So we really have a, a high level registration about how far we have to be apart from non-target areas. And you can see here, um, each farmer has to check about his application technique. Um, um, best or modern techniques would be 90 to 95% drift reducing. And uh, with these drift redu reducing techniques and sprays, you can uh, go five or 10 meters um, ahead to a non-target area, but re you really have to care much about in our area with a lot of small rivers and, and the lake beside. Next one. So I'm just looking about the time. So I have still 15 minutes, right? Okay. Um, I think uh, these uh, slides, this, the next 10 ones uh, could be also delivered to the students by Natalie because I will just rushing through and I will just, I would just want to, to give you some, some hints and some, um, yeah, some expressions. What is really important for us in January and February each year, we have to think about our strategy in our region. So we look which status do our orchards have? Uh, did we have a lot of apple scab infections the year before? Did we have some problems um, with uh, aphids or yeah, with, uh, with pests, also with new pests? And uh, then we look, okay, which IP production measures do we have? Do we have uh, more opportunity or more possibilities to work with beneficials or to improve beneficials in our orchards? And what is really important over the last 10 years is the quality assurance 
I'm caring about in our team. So really have a look, how can we minimize plant protection products? How can we reduce the amounts that we have to apply? Still producing the quality we need for the market. And uh, what about the environment, environmental impact, emissions and so on? Certification is really an important uh, uh, thing for us. Each single farm is certified each year on the farm. And uh, we have uh, those labels, local labels, but also global labels like Global GAP. And uh, I really try to educate our farmers. This is improving you. This is improving your work. This is not a control or just to, to make you some office work. Um, we really should use this certification to improve our IP. Um, cooperatives and stakeholders, um, this is getting more and more important for our strategy each year because the public has some wishes, um, less sprays, less noise, um, yeah, more biodiversity areas, and we really have to care about that for the strategies each year. And the sector planning politics, we had some public petitions last year and the year before. It was really hard work to explain to our neighbors, to our public, uh, what means IP, because they just did not rely on what we are doing. Also, we have really good results for beneficials and for wild bees. And what's new since last year, since COVID crisis, um, the availability of operating material resources, also of um, really bee caring plant protection methods. Um, yeah, we have to see which products are available, which uh, beneficials are available, available. And this is not too easy for the farmers last year and also this year, I think. So the next one. Um, our IPPM system really is uh, based on the family farm's work. So the family farmer himself, the boss of the farm, he's doing the plant protection, he's doing the education each year, he's talking to me as an uh, advisor or extensionist. And um, also I am really learning, I'm coached and educated by some farmers because they are bringing up new topics, they are bringing up new problems to be solved and all the 350 other farmers can participate and maybe avoid some problems with IP or improve their IP. And uh, the transfer of knowledge in the region itself, in Germany, FRG, and in the regions like Southern Tyrol, like Steiermark, Styria, um, and Tyrol, is very important for us. We are in close um, exchange with our colleagues there. So next one. The tools and topics, I will just uh, give uh, you the headlines. The modeling of the pest and the thresholds is very, very important with the models like RIMPRO for apples cap or SOPRA for uh, some insect pests. Um, the modeling of the weather conditions, we are really glad to have our own modeling in our federal state Baden-Württemberg because a good weather forecast is half, um, yeah, half the reliable facts um, when you are planning your IP. Um, what is from our cooperative is uh, the technique air check. So we are checking all our sprays. What is the air of our sprays doing? So our aim is to use less air to have uh, bigger efficacy for our plant protection products and to use less product um, with these air checks. Um, the monitoring and reduction of plant protection levels on the product is since 10 years my daily work. Uh, we're really looking on that we have not too many residues on the product and have a very, very low level of the residues, for sure, according um, to governmental um, recommendations. And uh, we try to integrate own techniques like um, on the uh, down on, on the left, Elise or Darwin. Elise is to collect some leaves from the ground. So we collect the apple cap spores and try, especially in ecological production, to prevent um, higher apple scab infections in the ongoing year. And Darwin is the technique to thinning. So we do not use, uh, in some varieties, chemical thinning anymore. We are using the Darwin machine for it. And uh, one of our fruit growers, in fact, invented it. So the next one. You have just a short glance on what we are trying to do with the air. We try to do a canopy adapted dosing and spray application, and we try to keep the air um, under control. Just the next one. 
Um, other tools that we integrated are evaluation and integration of biodiversity by external experts and entomologists um, that are doing the monitorings in our area to yeah, better know and understand the aspects in and beside our orchards uh, concerning biodiversity, especially about wild pollinators. Um, we are doing or are participating in research and development of the tree row management. Um, there is uh, published a manual 2021, um, which is available for free. Um, if there is interest in it, um, I can uh, forward um, where you can get it in the internet. And uh, this is a real public concern. So the public wants us to not to use any herbicides anymore in the tree row, but this is really a challenge. And uh, yeah, the one important thing is we have to explain why is this a challenge. And uh, the other thing is um, we have we would like to keep our colonies of wild bees in the soil, the soil bond ones, because uh, it's working relatively great in our opinion. And according to monitorings, using one glyphosate um, and having solitary bees uh, colonies in the ground. And um, yeah, we also have to support our ecological farmers. Um, which are members in our cooperative because they still using techniques um, that are not um, yeah, uh, yeah, increasing the population in the ground because they just have uh, to work on the ground. The communication about IP was very, very important two years ago because we have petitions. Um, if the petitions would have gone through the public, the government would uh, have been in charge to, um, yeah, to remove a lot of chemicals which are in a good IP use and which do not harm, in our opinion, beneficials and insects, um, but help us in the IP. And so we started a net about the network Blooming Lake Constance and with an initiative called Bodensee Biene, so lakeconstantb.de, um, we tried to communicate um, yeah, from our farmers um, to the public, and it works better and better, also the COVID crisis. And what was, what was really a success was a petition from the family farmers, so thousands of family farmers uh, put on a petition to Baden-Württemberg, um, safe environment together. Do not put only pressure on the agriculture and fruit growers, but also think about what you're doing in your gardens, um, that you're growing wild bees and so on. And this was the first successful protection for our Baden-Württemberg region. And we hope um, further on we will also succeed with these topics. So the next one. Um, and next. Um, so this is what we are doing today and uh, these days um, until, let's say, end of February. Um, we are going out um, under um, distance and COVID um, um, yeah, rules um, to our farmers and uh, are talking about pruning. Um, they are out in the snow and try to prune their trees so that uh, with the early bloom, maybe end of March and April, um, we are ready to start in the season. The next one. And we are really focused now with the pruning in the snow uh, on what crop we will have. Because as David said, um, when we get too much bloom and pollination uh, on, on the tree, we have to thin and we really have to struggle with the quality, with the fruit size, with the fruit quality. And so already now with the pruning, we are thinking about the crop we will harvest in September, October 2021. Next one. And so from November, Right after harvest uh, to January, February, we are thinking about the strategies we should follow for our IPP season, uh, which is following um, to get the right cropping, to get the right blooming, and to have a good quality on the trees. Thank you. All right, well, we do have a few minutes um, for questions. If anyone has some questions for Katya. Looks like the chat's been active. I haven't been able to see it while I've been hosting that talk. Yes, I've read over a few of the questions here. Um, um, and this can be for both speakers. Um, so these IPPM practices, are growers generally open to um, 
to implement them or does it require convincing and, and why are they interested in them? Is it a marketing um, reasons or is it um, more that they're interested in, you know, the ecosystem? From my experience has been basically, mainly we have to show them we're saving them some money. Growers are business people just like anybody else. And it'd be nice to save the bees and stuff, but they also gotta make the bottom line of staying in business. Uh, to, and they also tend to be, coming from a farm family myself, they tend to be pretty um, uh, conservative in trying new things. There's a few adopters that are leaders in the industry and they'll try anything for the first time. Our way of overcoming that was basically what I call putting NR, USDA NRCS's money where our mouth is. And we came up with these really good ideas to serve predatory mites, to put uh, mating disruption in, things like that. Get uh, private consultants rather than chemical companies to be their consultants. We got over $2 million to the growers just within this county to try these different techniques for three years. It takes, it was basically calculated to cover about 80% of the cost that we kind of guesstimated. So it took the risk out. And at the end of the three years, if they didn't want to do it, they could drop it. And that's the best way, you know, we got to, to get growers to try mite control by conserving beneficials. We're talking with Xerces about doing that with the bees as well, but Truth for the growers, I've worked with them long enough. They kind of, I'm, I'm right embedded with them. If I'm full of crap, they'll tell me. So they tend to believe me. And if it doesn't work out, they also tell me. <laughs> so uh, it, a lot of it comes down to trust, which it sounds like Katya does have her, in her area as well. It's just not pie in the sky stuff from people that are working in a lab. So you got to demonstrate it. You got to have the research stations. And if you take out some of the risk for cost, uh, that's been the most effective way we've had. Katja, can you answer this? Yeah, can you answer this from the German point of view? Because I think it's different than in the US. In fact, it's different, yeah. Um, what is different, we are yeah, really running out of registration, running out of plant protection products. Um, this is, in fact, uh, yeah, we have no high risk ones. We have, uh, I saw on David's list, the moderates ones, we have more or less one and a half moderate ones. And um, our growers are, are from, yeah, from 90s on really interested in beneficials and work with it. Um, but um, this year, especially, we were really running out of uh, plant protection products. And uh, for example, we have one or two plant protection products, uh, yeah, just the availability. Uh, we will not receive them, the active ingredients from China. Very simple like that. And uh, what is, for example, um, also our reality um, today is um, that we will maybe have to use lime sulfur in IP just because we are running out of fungicides because of all the global and COVID crisis. And this is really, um, yeah, just this example at the end for the students, maybe I, if we do not have any other chance to use a high risk, uh, product which uh, our ecological colleagues and, and members are really, uh, they have to from time to time to try to avoid it. But um, also in IP, we are um, more and more, as we see now, um, yeah, driven to use, for example, our spritzit, uh, a natural pyotride, um, which is uh, not really good for the IP, let's say. And um, to the ecosystem, our growers are really interested in the ecosystem since six or eight years. They're really happy, uh, the kids of the farmers, uh, the women, um, the farmers themselves, um, they are really keen on learning about the ecosystem and learning about the beneficials, learning about the wild bees. There's really also a big interest um, and therefore they want to improve in IP. Yeah, I saw that when I did work in Serbia, they were trying to join the European Union, their orchards. I was shocked at how few chemicals are still left to use in orchards in the, under the guidelines of the European Union and things like streptomycin. I mean, you mentioned thinning with those, uh, I think it's a string thinner, the fruit. We've tried it here, but we get so much fire blight that uh, we have problems with it. But we still can use streptomycin, which when I worked with the growers in Serbia, they're like, we, we go to the veterinary clinics, pull the little pills apart for vet use and use the streptomycin in our orchards and don't tell anybody because they're gonna lose the whole orchard to fire blight, but they're restricted from using it. So they get around the, the guidelines, but they're not supposed to. And you have very few fungicides. I mean, line sulfur to us 
repels bees for like three or four days. So we can't use it around the bloom time in the orchards or we'll just scare all the bees out. Have you seen that? Yes, and so you see how we yeah. struggle or how we work or how we use strategies each year about the fire blight. Um, I would say we were lucky the last years. So we had severe fire blight uh, infections some years ago. Um, then we could not use any more streptomycin. And I think it was okay because our beekeepers, they really struggle with it. And it's an antibioticum and it's just, uh, we were lucky and we all, were also glad to, to have something else. But then we got the LMA, I, um, it's, a, it's a, I can explain. Um, also our ecological farms can use it. And uh, it was just a struggle to apply. And if we would have really a severe fire blight infection, we couldn't do it, uh, I'm pretty sure. And now we maybe get another biological agent also for ecological as IP farms, but uh, we still were lucky because we have more and more very dry, warm um, springtime. Mm -hmm. And uh, at least two years, we were just lucky because the nectar of our bloom of our blooming was just that uh, uh, that uh, less you, uh, liquid that less liquid um, that the fire blight bacterium couldn't go through. Let's say, and this was just yeah. Climate change has also positive effects, maybe. But uh, if we get a severe fire blight year, yeah, we will see. Um, but uh, we won't go back uh, with the streptomycin. This is just gone. But what is also gone is some fungicides, some insecticides um, used in IP quite well in, in Northern U America, in other, other continents. But uh, I think for us, it's, uh, it's just gone. Um, and um, yeah, we will see. We will use uh, some biological like agents that maybe harm some beneficials. It seems like all the restrictions you have in the European Union on products, it's a lot like us trying to grow organic fruit in the East Coast where we get all the rain and, you know, fungicides are our biggest driver. That, that's two or three times the cost. And we're seeing, or I've got a student that's, we're seeing direct mortality from the fungicides on Osmia as well. So mm -hmm. and I think they're safe for the wild bees, but, you know, there's advantages in what you have because you're talking about bees nesting in the orchards. We do not see that because mm. in addition to glyphosate, we're using Paraquat and there's a product called Stinger that's very toxic to bees. The herbicides, I think, are killing most of the ground nesting bees. So I'd say 90% of our bees are flying in from outside the orchard still because we the, the ground cover, the soil is still too toxic for them. Mm -hmm. Well, I was really... <laughs> I, I was not sure. I was telling my farmers, please do not uh, put our wild bee houses, we call it, um, into the orchard. Um, please keep a distance and be aware and so on. And after two monitorings, um, the entomologist told us, okay, it's, it's okay. It should work also uh, for the solitary bees in the ground. We are uh, working together with the University of Hohenheim, with the uh, Bee Institute there, and they told us uh, for what is IP in Baden-Württemberg in Germany, it should work out. But we always have an eye on it and we always uh, yeah, are in close contact with entomologists because yeah, you, you don't know, you really have to care. I assume your main pollinators are adrenids and osmia for apple. Do you know what the main bee species are, the adrena and osmia? Uh, is osmia, yeah, during, during apple bloom is osmia. And um, yeah, one or two other species. Sorry, <laughs> I don't. I don't remember. Um, and uh, but the initiative we are working on is really about all the species that are somewhere around. If they are living in summertime or in late summer, it doesn't matter. So we are preparing um, our habitats with uh, sizes from nine millimeters to two millimeters. So our focus is really on the biodiversity um, of the wild pollinators and wild insects, not that much on the pollinators of our apples. Um, so it is like for you, um, we do have less problems. We have still a lot of private, we call it beekeepers, not professional beekeepers, but private ones that are happy to have some orchards around uh, where they can put their hives in. And uh, this in combination with our small structures around with the fences and so on and, and the plants and, and, and bushes and trees, it works quite well. We have some 
farms that are working with Osmia, with Osmia Konuta and um, the red one I call it. And um, they are really uh, putting the cockongs in summer in, in the fridge, in, in the barn, and uh, then taking it out, especially for apricots and stone fruits. Um, if we have cold conditions, it's just uh, the pollination quality that works very well. And uh, they're also putting cockongs out for apple uh, bloom. And uh, we think for some varieties, um, the, the pollination quality is really better. But uh, in general, we do not have any problems uh, with pollination. I think the weakness for us versus you is that I can convince growers they're saving money by relying on wild bees because of the cost mm -hmm. of honeybees. I can't get across to them. It sounds nice that we're conserving bees in general, the ecological part of it, but if it doesn't bring any money to them, it's less of an incentive. And that's where groups like NRCS, uh, you know, they give a billion dollars out a year to fruit growers or to, to growers in general to do things that are good for the environment. And we've been trying to go through Xerces to convince them that restricting a certain herbicide or, or whatever is not as effective as getting the ecological part about increasing bee diversity in general. I think that's a big missing piece we've got so far here that it would be nice to do that, but it's hard to quantify for a grower. And if it's gonna cost him extra money, he's gonna be less likely to adopt it. We did get a hundred hectares of pollinator ships go in. Ours are much further, about at least 20 meters from the orchard. So, because we're really worried about drift and we try to keep them square, not a long skinny uh, uh, pollinator planting that's only a few meters wide because it's too easy to set them up and basically concentrate all the bees and kill them with one bad spray. All right, so I love this discussion that we're having, but we have somewhere else to be. So if you're part of the class, I'm going to have us all jump over to our group discussion. Uh, David and Katya will be joining us there. And if you are just joining us for fun, for your own personal enjoyment, thank you so much. And we hope to see you next week. Thank you.